there's anything that we need to do before we begin? Uh, you're all set to go. I've just started recording. Uh, we've tested Morris's slides and his video, so whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Um, we'll just wait one minute and then and then we'll get started. So I'll talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, Jordan, is that the idea? Yes. Quarter to two. So yes. I'll try and stop by quarter to two. Yes, that sounds great. Okay. So um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm hoping that everyone can uh, hear and see myself and Morris well. Um, we are doing this first uh, educational rounds uh, via Zoom um, in the context of COVID. Mm -hmm. We had unfortunately had to cancel for the last month, um, but we felt strongly that um, still needed access to um, excellent uh, education around uh, responsive behaviors during this time and some support. So we uh, decided and thanked you to, to Morris Friedman who um, uh, continued to, to offer his expertise on this presentation. So just wanting to reiterate, these are our monthly behavior support rounds that are hosted by Baycrest and uh, Behavior Supports Ontario in conjunction with the Centers for Learning, Research and Innovation. Uh, we are the regional leads in the Toronto area for uh, the, ba the behavior support strategy and we are very, very happy to have Dr. Morris Friedman here today to talk about early onset dementias. Uh, Morris is uh, very well known and renowned in his area. Um, he is the head of neurology here at Baycrest as well as the medical director of the Sam and Ida Ross Memory Clinic and the attending uh, a neurologist um, and, and medical lead for the inpatient uh, behavioral neurology uh, unit at Baycrest. Um, so I want to just thank again Morris for coming and for all of you I see that uh, over 60 people have been able to join which is fantastic and I know there are several people um, who are, are joining together at different sites. What I'm going to ask everyone to do is just to mute your computers or your phones, however you're joining. Um, and if you have any questions, to enter them into the chat box. Um, you'll see the chat box cursor um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we are gonna save the questions to the end of the presentation. Morris is gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then um, I'll read some of the questions that have come up in the chat box and facilitate a, a question and answer period. So if that's all right, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Friedman. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Jordan. What I'm going to talk about today is early onset dementia, uh, which is a very important topic. Uh, I have no disclosures. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dis I just lost my screen share. Just hang on a second. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss the clinical presentation and management of early onset dementias. So this is a, a slide that shows you the sort of distribution in terms of, um, of uh, prevalence of the early onset dementias. And the ones with the um, asterisks are the ones I'm going to talk about. So the most common early onset dementias, now when I say early onset, what I'm really gonna be talking about is dementias that occur before age 65. But some of these dementias, such as Alzheimer's disease, is actually more common after age 65. So the focus is really gonna be on the dementias that you see in the younger age groups, but they don't necessarily um, only occur in that age group. And the um, most frequent ones are Alzheimer's disease, uh, vascular dementia, the frontotemporal uh, dementias, there's alcohol, which I'm not going to talk about, and dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, which, I, which I will talk about. So let's start with the behavioral variant uh, frontotemporal dementia. This is um, one of the dementias that, you, that we commonly see in people under age 65. It's a dementia that's characterized primarily by behavioral disorders as opposed to memory problems. 
if there are cognitive deficits, um, they're usually executive, although memory problems can occur uh, with this condition. But typically, these patients have very good memories. And the features of this, and I'm going to show you videos so that uh, you'll get a, a better sense of, of what I'm talking about. But these patients are early on quite disinhibited. They may say or do things that um, uh, they shouldn't say or do. Uh, they may be apathetic. Uh, they may lose the ability to sympathize with people, which means uh, share feelings. They may lose the ability to have empathy, which um, I'm using the term uh, in the way that um, what I mean by that is that they tend not to be able to understand or recognize other people's feelings. They may show uh, compulsive behavior, repetitive behaviors. There may be um, hyper orality where they um, uh, really eat anything in sight. There may be um, dietary changes where they have preferences for certain things. And in terms of the neuropsychological profile, um, it, they tend to have, if they have cognitive deficits, um, it's in the executive area. So let me show you um, a striking case. Uh, it's a video. So this is a 55-year-old woman, a school teacher, with a two-year history of frontotemporal dementia. And what you're going to hear and see is me talking to her and to her daughter. And what she, what her daughter will say that she does things like ha they'll have a dinner party, um, she'll sit down, gobble down her food in 30 seconds, and then start collecting everybody's plates because the dinner is over, because she's finished. But what she really got into trouble with at school is she went up to a student and she wrote the letter L on the student's forehead for loser. So I want to show you this, uh, this interaction. Has there been any changes in your behavior? Um, you know what, I, I, I really don't think so. I can ask your daughter, have, have you noticed any changes? I would say definitely. Can you give me some examples? A specific example, she had a dinner party and had, you know, a bunch of people over, invited everyone over, sat down, served everyone their food, raced through her own meal, and, you know, everyone's sitting there prepared for, you know, a night of two or three hours of, you know, eating and, you know, drinking and conversing, and all of a sudden she's gone through a meal and she's picking up everyone's plates and no one had finished their meal. No one had even, you know, really started their meal. She had decided the night was over and everyone, it was time for them to go home. Then at school, you know, some really, really strange behavior at her school was there was a, I got a call from one of the teachers and apparently she had written on a kid's forehead with a magic marker and she had written a big L on the kid's forehead for loser. Tell me exactly what happened with the letter L. Well, I, as I say, I, he was just, he's a good, good kid, and he was just being a little bit silly, and so I put the L on his forehead. But why did you go up to that particular student? Because he was just being silly. <laughs> what do you mean? He was just, um, he was just sort of standing up and doing a little dance and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then what did you do? That's when I went over and put it on. Okay, so that is um, a very typical example of a patient who, who's, right, who's really quite disinhibited and has very poor judgment. So I'm going to show you another video of a man who um, also was inappropriate. Um, what he, you're going to hear me talking to um, his wife first, and then I'll be talking to him. And you'll, you'll notice his wife, um, he had this thing where he wanted to, he shaved his eyebrows and he thought that that uh, looked quite attractive. At the end, he'll um, uh, ask me why I don't shave my eye drops, my eyebrows. And he also thought that being bald uh, was, uh, was magnificent. So look at this video. In his eyebrows, he, I caught him shaving and it's not just once. The problem is we have been begging him, my sons and I, don't touch your eyebrows. Don't touch the dog. <laughs> Don't shave the dog. Don't shave your eyebrows. And he thinks that people who are bald, I know it didn't come across that way. We had dinner with friends and Marie's bald. And he thinks how lovely he looks and how wonderful it is. But he thought that Marie was shaving his head. You said that he thinks that shaving 
the head is is beautiful. Yes, he thinks it's beautiful. You're magnificent to him. <laughs> I noticed that you also shaved your eyebrows. Yeah. Why do you do that? I just did it once. But why, why did you do that even the once? Well, it, uh, I, I just didn't want it there anymore. I met some people that uh, they've shaved theirs and they were looking good. And I thought I would try the same. And it doesn't do anything. What does yours uh, do for you? The eyebrows? Yeah. I never thought about that. But if you shaved it, uh, it might look great on you too. Okay. So that, um, this is also a patient um, who, the one that you saw, um, uh, suffered from the, what's on the next slide. And that is hyperorality, where he would, uh, th these patients can binge eat, um, they can um, eat a lot, drink a lot of alcohol, smoke a lot of cigarettes, uh, put things in their mouths that don't belong. Um, and in fact, um, this patient um, was talking to um, uh, Mindy, um, uh, nurse clinician in the, in the memory clinic, and there was a flower on her desk, and he grabbed the flower and ate it. So um, we're very careful now to make sure that all flowers are, are edible. And when he was on our inpatient unit, he ate rubber gloves uh, and he tried to eat a CD. Uh, this man actually died because he um, stuffed himself with uh, cake and, um, and, and choked. That was the, the patient that I showed you um, who talked about uh, shaving the eyebrows. So these patients can have um, increased, um, they can have hyperorality. Um, in terms of um, treatment uh, for this condition, there is actually no treatment, uh, but drugs that can help symptomatically include um, the uh, SSRIs like uh, sertraline, citalopram, uh, trazodone, there's a small study, but trazodone actually has one of the best evidence uh, that it might help um, with the behavior. And clomipramine, which is an old drug, uh, might help with the compulsive behaviors that don't respond to uh, the SSRIs or to trazodone. And we actually published a, a series of three cases that uh, improved with uh, clomipramine. Now, there are disorders that are related to um, frontotemporal dementia. Um, and um, three of those are, there's cortical basal syndrome, which I'll talk about in a moment, progressive supranuclear palsy, which I will also talk about, and uh, motor neuron disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, these disorders um, can be associated with frontotemporal dementia. Now, cortical basal syndrome, it, it's characterized by patients who have um, uh, idiomotor apraxia, which is a high order uh, movement disorder, and it's often focal on one side. They can have an alien limb, and what happens there is as they're walking, for example, one arm may sort of drift off uh, to the side of the body and raise. They can have cortical sensory loss, they can have neglect, they can have trouble drawing, they can have myoclonus, and they can have uh, language problems. Um, and they also have features of Parkinsonism, and it, it typically does not respond uh, to the medication that's used for Parkinson's, and um, they can also have dystonia. I'm gonna show you a video uh, of a patient with this disorder, so you can at least hear what the, uh, what the speech is like. Okay, so it is January, February, March, April. April. Okay, and that type of strained speech um, is uh, one of the features that is quite typical of patients in the more advanced stage. Um, there's, the, as I say, there's a lot of Parkinsonism. Um, there is some. Um, that kind of speech. There may be an arm that levitates um, as, they're, as they're walking. Um, and it's called cortical basal syndrome. And now this syndrome is not specific uh, to its association with frontotemporal dementia. 
You can also see it in other disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. Progressive supranuclear, supranuclear palsy is another condition that's related to frontal temporal dementia. And one of the hallmarks of this condition is that the eye movements, looking up and looking down, are impaired. And it's called supranuclear because what happens there is if somebody can't raise or lower their eyes, if you get them to fixate on something and you passively move their head up or down, the range of the eye movement increases. And that's because the um, lesion is above the um, brain nucleus that controls the eye movement. So let me show you a video um, of that. Are you having any problems? Is the frontal temporal dementia? Is the frontal temporal dementia causing any problems for you? I don't know, it's going to be a Is your behavior normal? Yes, normal. Let me, let me try and do something. When you talk, I want you to tap. Okay. For every word, tap. Okay. Say the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, M, N, O, E, G, R, S, T, U, E, I, R, S, T, U, E. Okay, I want, you to go I want you to go very slowly. A, B, B C, D, E, F, G. Just follow my finger. And you can see that it's, it's limited in his eye movements up and down. Follow it this way. And when I passively do it, the eye movement range is greater. And what you saw when I had him pace, it's the concept of the pacing board that's uh, used by speech pathologists. If people are speaking very fast and it's hard to understand them, if you get them to tap, um, they, they, they tend to be able to regulate the this, this speech and be more understood. And there's something called a pacing board where people can tap different grooves on a board to improve the um, quality of their speech. And motor neuron disease, which is uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, that is also associated with frontal temporal dementia. Okay, now there, the, the, what I just described, you see that in people under age 65. Um, it is um, a common cause of dementia in that group. Now there's the other part of frontal temporal dementia. Um, I described the behavior. Now there's, there's a group of disorders called primary progressive aphasias. And this is a progressive language disorder. Um, it's essentially isolated to language in the initial stage. And two of the types of primary progressive aphasia are associated with frontal temporal dementia. So in order to have primary progressive aphasia, the, um, there are two parts to the diagnosis. The um, speech and language problem has to meet the diagnostic criteria for a primary progressive aphasia, which, um, uh, and also there are, they have to meet the criteria of the type of primary progressive aphasia. So in order for the overall criteria, the most prominent clinical feature initially has to be language. The language deficits have to be the main cause of the difficulty that the person has. And it's supposed to be the most prominent for at least two years. So basically, they've got a progressive language disorder of about two years duration. Now, in terms of the non-fluent, which is one of the types, and I'll show you a video, these patients um, tend to be agrammatical, so they tend to have trouble with the small parts of um, speech, like pronouns and prepositions. They have effortful speech. Um, they um, uh, are, have difficulty with comprehension for complex sen sentences. Their single word comprehension, however, is, is good, and their ability to um, recognize objects is good. Let me show you a video of a patient with this. Look, my, my middle son, mm -hmm. uh, he and I both 
enjoys So you and your middle son enjoy doing something together. Yeah. Or it's not yes. together. It's it's the same thing that you enjoy doing. Yes, on a Saturday afternoon for uh, to, to, to Toronto. Movie. Do you go to the movies together? No. 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 That's not what we're trying to say. Even if we're at different places, slices or countries. Is there something on TV that you like watching on Saturday afternoon? This listening and and uh, so much sort of what what Robert um, uh, he started to use it. Um, when I learned about it, this, this, this part. <laughs> okay, so that's a typical example of a progressive non-fluent aphasia. Now, another type of aphasia that you see in, in patients with frontotemporal dementia is what's called semantic dementia, or the semantic variant of, um, of uh, it, it's got different names, but semantic dementia is the one that, that, that I tend to use. And these patients um, have great difficulty with um, knowing the, the meaning of words. So what they do is they say, um, they may even say the word like watch, what's a watch? So it's, a, it's as if the word is in a different, is a language that they don't understand. Um, so they have great difficulty with single uh, word comprehension, and they may also have difficulty knowing what objects are when shown to them. I'm going to show you a video of a patient with this disorder. Could you tell me what, what difficulties you're having? Uh, my difficulty is that I have not able to remember words that I should be able to, that I used to know very well. I'm going to ask you some questions to test your understanding. Okay. You see, understanding is even a word that's the pits for me. <laughs> the surface that you walk on. Can you point to the source of illumination? The source of illumination. Here we go. What's illumination? I don't know. I'd like you to take the right hand, okay? The left hand stays still. Pretend that you're hammering a nail. That's what my husband does all the time, and I don't do that. Show me how you pretend to hammer a nail. A nail, a nail, hammer, a nail, a nail, a nail. I don't know. I don't know what do. Okay, now I'm going to show you a patient with more severe semantic dementia. I'm going to ask you to do some things. I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? Yeah, I don't know what. I'd like you to point to some things. Could you point to the ceiling? Point to the ceiling? Yes. What is the ceiling? Is the ceiling here? There is a ceiling here. Could you point to the ceiling? Uh, no, I don't know. Point to your watch. Point. To my watch, I don't understand. What's my watch? I don't know. I don't know. Point to your watch. Point to my watch. 
Actually, I forget what that is to watch. What is to, what is to, I know the, what is to watch? Can you close your eyes? Good, close my eyes Some, sometimes, yeah. Can you open your mouth? Open my mouth? Open your mouth. Yeah. Actually, I'm sorry to say I lost my brain now. Okay, so you can see how he says the words, but doesn't know what they mean. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is switch to early onset Alzheimer's disease. So early onset Alzheimer's disease, that the definition is when they're let, people are less than 65. Now 30 um, to 40%, the Alzheimer's patients make up 30 to 40% of the dementia cases under 65. And the autosomal dominant genes, so the heredity, um, the, the, it is 1% of, uh, makes up 1% of all Alzheimer patients, but in those under 65, it makes up about 5%, okay? And in terms of the presentation, the Alzheimer's disease usually starts off with memory problems, but these patients um, more often have a presentation that is not related to memory at the beginning. And anywhere from 22 to 64% of patients under age 65 have these non-memory presentations, whereas it's only about 6% uh, in those over 65. And um, this form of Alzheimer's disease um, has a more aggressive course. So in terms of the presentations, there's a visual spatial presentation. And these patients have great difficulty with um, visual spatial function. Um, and there's a term called posterior cortical atrophy, which applies to these patients. Um, their memories may be pretty good, their language may be pretty good, but their visual spatial abilities are very poor. Another form of non-memory presentation is one of the progressive aphasias. It's called logopenic progressive aphasia. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. Um, patients can also present with executive or frontal system findings, and they can present with, um, with, it, with an apraxia. So what I wanna do is show you a video of a patient with um, logopenic um, progressive aphasia. And the, the, one of the, there's a lot of things on this slide, but one of the main things that these patients have is poor repetition and they've got word finding difficulty. So I wanna show you a video of a patient with logopenic primary progressive aphasia. So this patient is gonna be uh, describing the uh, cookie theft picture. And I want you to listen carefully to what uh, she's, how she's talking. I don't know, it's a sickness. Okay, I am going to show you a picture. Oh, I'm, bad at, I'm bad at these. So. Yeah, I would like you to tell me everything you see going on. Oh, and I think we've got just put on my glasses. Yeah. I'm bad at these things. Where's my little glasses? Here you are. Two dollars. <laughs> As long as it works? Yeah, that's what the, my, I went to the specialist. He says, get one of these. Oh, okay, that's right. You want me to tell you what I see? Yes. Please. Okay, the boy is on the um, little ladder. He's going to fall off it, and he's taking cookies out, and he's sending them to his sister. The mother is wiping her dishes. The water overflew, and she has some dishes on the counter, and she has her window open and she can see her, her, her uh, walkway and the bushes and the windows and the tree and the curtain here. And the mother is wearing an apron, a sleeveless dress, and uh, she's in the kitchen. And I think that's it. I think so. So what's going to happen here? He's going to fall. And what's happening here? She's getting um, a, a drink. Um, the water is going to damage the floor. So with all this happening, why isn't she doing anything? I think she's daydreaming. She's thinking about oh, something. Right. 
Okay, you can hear there's a lot of errors in speech. And she said, instead of overflow, she said overflew, the water overflew, um, which is a paraphasic error. Uh, instead of stool, she called it a little ladder. So there's a lot, there were a lot of word substitutions or sound substitutions. Now, I mentioned repetition is a big a problem here. You're gonna hear this patient repeat. For some of them, she's quite good, but you'll see how um, on some of the more difficult items, she has a lot of difficulty. Sentences. Um, you know how. You know how. Limes are sour. Limes are sour. Down to earth. Down to earth. The bath leaks. The bath leaks. I got home from work. I got home from work. The spy fled to Greece. I didn't get that. I'll say it again. The spy fled to Greece. Oh, the spy, the spy, the spy. Went to Greece. Okay. Near the table in the dining room. Near the table in the dining room. The barn swallow captured a plump worm. Okay, can you repeat that again? Certainly. The barn swallow captured a plump worm. The barn swallow carried its okay. Warm. Mm, I didn't get it. You got some of it. Yeah. Let's try a different one. Okay. They heard him speak on the radio last night. They heard me speaking on the radio last night. The phantom soared across the foggy heath. Can you repeat that again? Certain. The phantom soared across the foggy heath. The phantom went across the Okay. That's all right. Okay, so you heard the, the, the repetition is, is one of the biggest things for the logopenic progressive aphasia. And just to, before we go on to the vascular cognitive impairment, um, so in early onset Alzheimer's disease, it is a more rapid, um, more aggressive course. Um, there are more often the autosomal dominant uh, genes involved. Um, you get the non-memory presentations, like the language presentations, the visual, spatial, the executive. Um, so that, that sort of captures the, the main things for the early onset Alzheimer's disease. Now, vascular cognitive impairment is another one. You see it in older people, but you also can see it in younger people. And there's a term called vascular cognitive impairment. That term encompasses the full range of cognitive deficits, all the way from mild cognitive impairment of vascular origin um, to um, more severe vascular dementia. So it's, a, it's an all-encompassing uh, term. Um, and, and their criteria. I mean, a lot of people have, uh, have strokes, but in order to actually call something vascular dementia, you have to have dementia plus imaging evidence showing that there's some relationship between the stroke and the onset of the cognitive deficits, or there has to be a relationship between the severity of the cognitive impairment and the presence of um, vascular findings um, on, um, on neuroimaging. Now, what's interesting is that in, in, in vascular dementia, you have sudden declines. You don't get a gradual progressive cognitive decline. When you have that, it suggests that there's a combination of the vascular dementia plus Alzheimer's disease. And the commonest setting for Alzheimer's disease is Alzheimer's disease together with vascular disease of the brain. Okay, I wanna shift now to um, the last one, which is dementia with uh, Lewy bodies. Uh, this is common in older people, but it's also common in younger people. And here you have dementia plus two of the following, uh, very prominent hallucinations, prominent fluctuations, and I'll show you a video of what I mean by prominent fluctuations, spontaneous features of Parkinsonism, which means not drug-induced Parkinsonism, 
and something called REM sleep behavior disorder, which is where people act out their dreams when they're, when they're sleeping. Normally when you're dreaming, your body is paralyzed except for the eye movements. But in this condition and some other neurological disorders, the body is not paralyzed and people tend to act out their dreams. So here is a um, video of an 84 year old physician got very prominent hallucinations. Usually when these patients have hallucinations, they're not, often not aware, but he is very aware. Um, but I wanted to show you this to show you how prominent they can be. Are you having hallucinations? <laughs> yes, I'm having hallucinations. But I don't list them as being something that's very bothersome. It may be more bothersome to my wife than it is to me, but it's not really bothersome. In as much as they started when I was here in the hospital, as a matter of fact, my recollection. And the first thing I saw, because I was here during the early winter of cars, was looking out the window. Yeah, just hang on a second. Window on the third floor where I was hospitalized, looking out, and all the rooftops there seemed to be flat and even. And uh, <clears throat> there were people by the dozens, or several, I would say more than dozens, but I call it by the dozens, plus a game of hockey, ice hockey, going on up there on the roof. And every day, when I looked out on that roof, those people would come out and do a little dance for me, uh, ice skating, a little hockey to watch. The trouble is I had to watch it alone because what else saw it. But that, uh, once I got used to it, I could recognize that that wasn't real. And uh, so it didn't bother me. It was rather entertaining, as a matter of fact. And incidentally, when the weather changed from winter to spring, so did the, 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 the ice hockey ended, football was being played up there. I thought that was the most interesting observation. Okay, so that shows you how prominent these hallucinations can be. Now, REM sleep behavior disorder, I described that. That's where a person is no longer paralyzed when they're dreaming. And often these dreams can take a self-defense quality um, and people punch and kick. And sometimes the, it, it actually, they actually hurt their bed partner. So it's called REM sleep behavior disorder. Now fluctuations, that refers to very wide swings in cognition, attention, alertness can occur over minutes, hours, or days. I want to show you a video of a patient's daughter describing the fluctuations. So we're not talking about just sort of being a little better at the end, at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. Listen to this video. One breath being very confused, just to saying, I'm, you know, I've been here all day waiting for the train. Where's mom? I don't know what she's doing. What, what am I supposed to be doing here? And then uh, if I say something that triggers a memory or about my own work, he can be, okay, dear, fine. I'll see you tomorrow. And he can be right uh, talking about everything very sensibly. Yeah, so it's really quite a, a, a marked change. Um, so people can be very good at one moment and very bad at another moment. The other cognitive problems that you see in Lewy body disease, you see very prominent visual spatial deficits, attentional problems, and executive fu function problems. Now, verbal memory tends to be less impaired in Lewy body disease than in Alzheimer's disease, but it can be severely impaired. And this shows you the visual spatial. Um, and the visual spatial is worse in Lewy body disease than Alzheimer's. This is from um, a publication and you can see somebody co copying um, a clock with Lewy body disease and a clock copy with Alzheimer's. And you can see that the Lewy body clock on top is much more severely impaired. 
and it's a copy. So it's a real measure of visual spatial function. And for executive function, you can see um, perseveration. That's where here the person's supposed to be alternating square and triangular figures. And you can see they start repeating um, the triangular figures. Um, so they're not alternating properly. So that's executive function. That's common in Lewy body disease. And I just want to explain, um, uh, we're almost done. I just want to explain the difference between dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease with dementia, because many of these patients have Parkinsonism and they look like they have Parkinson's disease. And there's something called the one year rule. And that is if the cognitive problems precede the physical Parkinsonism by more than a year, we call it dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, if the Parkinsonism comes first, um, then we call it Parkinson's with dementia. So that is sort of the one year rule. So if the cognitive problems proceed with one year or more, it's dementia with Lewy bodies. If it's less, it's Parkinson's with dementia. And if the cognitive problems come after the Parkinson's, it's Parkinson's disease with dementia. Okay, in terms of treatment um, for the cognitive problems with Lewy body disease, um, the cholinesterase inhibitors may help with the cognition and the um, um, hallucinations. And the best evidence is for rivastigmine. Um, the, we, we tend, however, to give um, um, other cholinesterase inhibitors like venepacil or galantamine because they're easier to give. They're once a day drugs and rivastigmine uh, is not a once a day drug if you use the capsules. It is once a day if you use the patch, but in Ontario, uh, the patch uh, is not covered for seniors, but we're talking about early onset dementia. None of these drugs are covered for people under 65. Okay, so what we've done is we've discussed early onset dementia, and you have to understand that when I say early onset, it doesn't mean that they just occur in early onset, um, but they are seen in people under 65. And what we covered was frontotemporal dementia. We covered Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. So on that note, I'm gonna stop and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks so much, Morris, that's terrific. I especially uh, loved all those case scenarios and videos to really illustrate um, some of the things that you were describing. Um, we have two questions that are already in the chat box. Um, the first is from um, the behavior support addictions specialist, Marilyn, and she asks about uh, alcohol use and other compulsive behaviors like gambling. And uh, she mentions a particular medication and what your opinion on that would be. Yeah, I think what you're referring to is that um, in, in terms of medication, um, with Parkinson's disease, um, some of the drugs can actually stimulate, um, some of the dopamine agonists can actually stimulate uh, or, or cause a compulsive gambling. Um, and we, we see that. Now you can see compulsive behavior outside of Parkinson's disease that has nothing to do with drugs. Um, for example, in, um, uh, in frontotemporal dementia, you can see compulsive behavior, you can see compulsive drinking, compulsive smoking. So you can see it as a drug-induced phenomenon, which you see in Parkinson's with some of the medication. You can see it as part of the actual um, uh, disease in frontal temporal dementia. I don't know if I answered your question. Marilyn, feel free to, uh, to reply in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, we'll go to the next question. Um, so Sarah Gies, who's a, a behavior support specialist working in acute care um, through UHN, is asking about hypersexuality in frontotemporal dementia, uh, particularly if, if, a, if a certain kind of medication is helpful for, um, for addressing the, the symptoms of hypersexuality in FTD. I mean, you can get, hypersexuality can have different causes, but it can be due to a disinhibition. Um, the, the problem, it, it's very difficult to treat hypersexuality. Um, it, 
the drugs are often ineffective. Um, sometimes people use anti-androgen anti drugs. Um, I've not been that impressed. Um, sometimes we use um, SSRIs, treating the hypersexual behavior as a, as a compulsion. Um, some, it's a difficult behavior to treat. Yeah, and I, and I think in the inpatient uh, areas, it's often a, 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 an understanding of exactly what the kind of behavior it is. Is it compulsion or is it uh, due to, you know, urges? And, and if so, can we marry some of the non-pharmacological interventions with the pharmacological and see how, how we can support that? So uh, agreed, it is often quite difficult and, and takes some time to riddle out. Um, I wanted to open it up for any questions. Oh, here we go. So Sarah Milton asks, um, self-injurious be behaviors. So for example, perseverating behaviors like hitting their head, uh, hitting their own head or banging on the door repeatedly, um, those kind of perseverating behaviors. Um, she's asking about obviously restraining them physically is not what they would like to do. Is there any kinds of advice that you would give? Again, it depends on what's, what the cause is. Um, and it also depends if you can figure out the cause. If it's a compulsive behavior, then there are medications that the SSRIs in particular, we would use to treat that behavior. Sometimes people um, compulsively hurt themselves because there's something bothering them, like there's an itch or an irritation um, and, and, and they're trying to, um, to, to get rid of that. If that's the case, then you got to treat the, you know, is it a skin lesion? Is it, uh, is it something local that, uh, that's uh, uncomfortable for, for the person? So it really, with all of these behaviors, I think a key um, part of figuring out how to manage it is to see if you can get some idea as to what's causing it. Um, and for the kind of behavior that you're describing, you know, is it a compulsive behavior? Is it some kind of habit that they've developed? Um, is it some kind of, um, uh, you know, pain, irritation, itch, or something like that? Great. Um, Elizabeth Lacan, who is one of the community behavior support clinicians, is asking about someone with semantic dementia and whether there's any treatment for someone with that particular kind of. The, there's speech language pathology interventions that can be done. There's no actual medication. There's no pharmacological treatment for that disorder. Okay, great. So um, I believe um, through the memory clinic, though, we have uh, one of uh, the, the experts in, in the speech language pathology area, uh, Regina Ajokol, who, who does um, do some of those assessments. Is that correct? Yes, um, she is doing research um, in primary progressive aphasia. And uh, as part of her research, uh, it, it consists of, of different kinds of therapies. So she has some um, groups that, uh, that she works with. And um, I, I refer my patients with semantic dementia and other kinds of primary progressive aphasias to her. Okay, great to know. Thanks, Morris. Um, Penny Ascroft, who is another of the cl community um, uh, uh, nurse clinicians is asking, um, what the relationship is between early onset dementia and potential suicide risk. So is there a screening that you particularly are concerned with when someone comes in with early onset? Okay. Um, I, I've had one patient with dementia commit suicide, and that patient did have early onset uh, dementia. Um, the risk of... It's an interesting question. The risk of suicide, uh, I don't think it's so much related to early or late. I think it relates to the insight that the person has at the time that they get the diagnosis. So if someone gets the diagnosis early, and I mean, that's when it would occur. It wouldn't occur because people with, with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, as it progresses, they lose insight. So that's not, when, that's not a time that you would get um, suicide. And another, type, another concern is with um, 
genetic testing and you can get pre-symptomatic diagnoses, people can actually find out that they're carrying an autosomal dominant gene um, for a dementia. And that can cause great depression, uh, great concern. So there's where one would, would worry about that, whether it's early or late. Right, great, thank you. Thank you for that, Morris. Um, uh, Rupa is asking about uh, people with a diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia, um, and if there's um, a, you know a, a prognosis where we're, we're seeing that there's a rapid uh, deterioration, and we're cons we're concerned that uh, this person might uh, uh, need palliative care or sort of more end of life approaches. Um, how how you handle those types of um, discussions, and how do you um, do you refer to palliative care or type of types of approaches that are are more around treating symptoms and making the person comfortable? Um, what's your approach on on rapidly pro progressing FTD? Okay, I, I think the the approach my approach might be different from others because the approach will vary upon uh, on the stage and the circumstances in which. Um, a physician, a healthcare professional comes in contact with the patient. So I will see these patients, um, for example, in the memory clinic. So they, they're the ones that the patients that are living at home, the discussion there when it's rapidly progressive is to find a more uh, supportive environment and in, in, in application to long-term care. Um, now, patients who are in long-term care, who are severely impaired or rapidly progressing, that's where the discussions might go um, once they're very, very severely impaired into palliative care. So I actually don't have um, those kinds of patients because I don't work in a long-term care facility. So I'm seeing patients in the community who are progressing rapidly and, become, and can be quite severely impaired, but there we're talking about the caregiver can't look after them at home. So we don't jump from there to palliative care. But if they were in long-term care, I could see those discussions going on. Okay, so maybe in involving some of those palliative specialists in those cases in a, in a collaborative care planning about, uh, about that end of life time. Okay, Jade asks, um, if there's any medication to assist patients with frontal temporal dementia to either quit or reduce their smoking behaviors, as you mentioned, often there's a disinhibition where they're um, continually seeking sort of oral stimulation and smoking could be one example. Yeah, there, there's no good therapy. The therapies that we try are serotonergic drugs like the um, uh, SSRIs. Those are drugs like citalopram, uh, S-citalopram, sertraline. Um, and uh, as I say, we published um, uh, a paper with clomipramine for, um, for, for, for compulsive behavior. Great, and I think that is would be in conjunction with obviously nicotine replacement therapies and, and other things like that. Okay, great. Uh, Patricia Leon asks regarding insight. Um, if by the time the clients reach um, the specialist or, or, or seeking treatment, um, she's asking generally if people have insight by the time they're coming to see a specialist or a specialized unit. It depends on the disorder. With frontotemporal dementia, usually not, because those patients lose insight very early. With Alzheimer's disease, often in the early stages, insight is, it, it may not be 100%, um, but there's a fair amount of insight. So it really depends on, for, for Alzheimer's, for Lewy body disease, it depends on the stage. The more severe they are, the less likely they are to have insight. With frontotemporal dementia, pretty well right at the beginning. Right, okay. Um, we just have two minutes left. So um, I'm, I'm going to just ask folks, I will stay on here. If people have uh, further questions, please do enter it into the chat box before you leave. And what I'll, I'll do is I'll try to collect those questions um, and, and see if, if Dr. Freeman has um, some, some time to be able to respond to some of them and, and get back to you specifically. If you can please um, include your um, uh, email or, or phone contact so we can get back to you. You can use, um, you'll see on the top of the chat, there's a, 
a selection you can send the chat to everyone or just to a particular person. If you can select me, which is Jordan Holland, um, then you can send a private message and, and we will try to get those answers to you. Um, Morris, you can see that folks are really engaged. <laughs> they have a lot of questions. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak to folks here today. Um, I know this is an area where um, there's a lot of particular, um, there's a lot of variation in the kinds of cases um, that are early onset and, and people do struggle. Um, I just wanted to um, let everyone know that um, they can reach out to their local Behaviour Support Ontario Coordinating Office for support. A lot of these um, uh, interventions that Morris mentioned are a mix between um, the non-pharmacological and pharmacological approaches and we're happy to um, help and support you in getting connected to the right resources, whether that is non-pharmacological through some of our BSO teams, or whether that's through pharmacological through connecting you to some of the specialists, which could include Morris himself uh, at the memory clinic. So uh, thank you so much, Morris, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, again, feel free to message me privately. Uh, I'll put my, um, my uh, email address to everyone so you can reach out to me if you have any questions. And otherwise, um, what we'll do is send out a survey to folks to fill out about the session today and just to get some feedback about how it went and if there's any other topics that you would like to see forthcoming. All right. Thanks, folks. Take care. Thank you.